I was at the trial in Memphis. I want to show you all quickly, explain to you why that jury of six blacks and six whites after three hours came back and found that white boy guilty of conspiring to kill Dr. Martin Luther King. And they went further than that. They also said there was some co-conspirators, black folks, unnamed, that was involved. I want to show you a little three-minute clip. of the minister that Dr. King was going by his house for dinner. He was due at 7, but they had to move it up because 7 would be a little too dark to shoot somebody. So they moved it to 6 o'clock. Two years ago at a press conference in Memphis, I get a call. And they say, so-and-so, so-and-so is thinking about killing so-and-so, so-and-so. I said, what? Well, he said something at a press conference, said, put him on the phone. I said, whatever you do, get that film. Because once NBC realized what this brother had slipped and said, we will never get our hands on the film. What you're fixing to see now went into the evidence in the King trial where they brought a wrongful death suit now. Explain that to you quickly in a minute. But what you're fixing to witness now is the, the man who came by to get King to take him to dinner. And 30 years later at a press conference, he slipped because God do baffle your mind sometimes. You look. geared especially for the young uh, who did not have a chance to, to get to feel or to know what the civil rights movement actually was about. Even as they marched, now they could have uh, stopped in a hotel, but when you think about marching from Memphis to Jackson or Jackson to Memphis, there were no hotels. You, you stayed in churches, you stayed in people's homes, and, and, and that's how we got over, that's how we got through. Uh, the struggle was a very, it was a spiritual struggle. You couldn't pay people to do what we had to do. You couldn't pay people to stand before mad dogs and fire hoses and, and billy clubs and, and cattle prods. It was strictly uh, a spiritual and moral movement. So we wanted that dimension to be in the pilgrimage to Memphis. We will revisit the mountaintop speech site. That's the Mason's Temple where Dr. King made his last address, which he almost didn't make, because the night that uh, we were having that rally, there were tornado warnings, and he was behind on the Poor People's Campaign. And he said, you guys go on over and have the rally. I'm gonna stay at the motel and work on the Poor People's Campaign. When we got there, and Dr. Abernathy walked in, and Jesse Jackson walked in, and I walked in, and others, people started clapping because they thought Martin was behind us. And so Ralph's preacher sent, said to him, this is not our crowd. And he went to the... This is not our crowd? What do we mean? The whole rally was about King. Everybody wanted to hear King speak. What did this guy mean by this is not our crowd? It was evident that it wasn't their crowd from the beginning. Preacher sent, said to him, this is not our crowd. And he went to the phone and called Dr. King. And that any of the marches that, 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 that we had in those days... You have an opportunity to bring the children and bring the family and march with us. And when I finished sharing with them the last hour of Dr. King's life, a hurry. But that gave me the wonderful privilege of spending the last hour on earth. Three preachers in a room, Abernathy, King, and Kyle. And we spent that last hour together in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel. Why did this guy emphasize the number 306 like that. I think this is a code 
and he's sending out a message to somebody that he's working for. The press is always curious and writers, what went on? What did you talk about? I say, we just talk preacher talk. What preachers talk about when they get together? Y'all pay and all what the you fixing to hear now. About a quarter of six, we walked on the balcony and he was talking to people in the courtyard. He stood here and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. Thank you. I turned around and then I him back on the balcony. Just... Listen. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, wait, listen, listen. Okay, right here, Gregory believes that the man never realized that he slipped up and said that. But I beg to differ, and I'm going to show you why. Hold on. Check out this photograph. This is the first and only time that this man made any type of gestures. And as he was reaching up to scratch his neck, it's evidence that he realized that he had said something wrong. He had slipped up. Do you know what happened when you're sitting in a jury room about a conspiracy and this piece of film is introduced? I stood, he stood here, I stood here, only as I moved away so he could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. Hey. This was the brother that he was going by his house for dinner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, to my brother Maddox, you will have a copy of this tape. I'll get it back to you. And what you should do is make copies. See to it, because this is a very valuable. And y'all need to send this tape to people all over this country. I'm doing one better than that. I'm sending it to people all over the world. All you got to do is watch this video. And so this was the trial that went on that the press didn't want to report because they couldn't. Huh? They couldn't. And so we have to stop getting mad and upset because the same system that's killing us refused to tell us the truth. You have to use your own given, God-given intelligence. If we was all over in Germany today walking down the street and we see this big old building and it's named after Adolf Hitler, you don't have to be too smart to realize something evil is going on inside that building. <laughs> well, how come you don't understand that when you walk down in Washington DC and see that big old brand new FBI building named after J. Edgar Hoover? How come we don't know something evil is going on inside that building? And to that point, why didn't they realize that something evil was going on inside of that Mason's temple where they held a gathering where King made the mountaintop speech? Masons have a reputation for doing rituals and black magic and being part of occult societies skull and bone and illuminati and all those type of organizations why didn't they realize that something evil was taking place inside of that mason's temple that's why it was imperative that they get king and bring him over to the temple because they needed to hold that ritual you heard the trial should have lasted a day and a half it lasted 30 days it should have lasted 30 days the black press in memphis didn't even show up Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how this trial came about. About six years ago, a white man named Lloyd Jones, who probably, now this is just my philosophy, believe, who probably was told they fixed to blame the king murders on you. So he went to ABC 
And they did a whole section with him, telling them how he was involved and what the conspiracy and who it was. And then they never ran. And so now he's running for his life. So he goes to the King family. And he tells them the same thing that he told ABC. He tells them three times and the fourth time, Andy Young. And they filmed it, they taped it. And he said, I was given a hundred thousand dollars by Frank Liberto, who was the mafia puppet who ran Memphis for the big mafia boys out of New Orleans. So it was Frank Liberto, he said, that gave him $100,000 to set up the whole mechanism for killing King. And the building right behind the Lorraine Hotel with the courtyard bumped into, Lord Jarvis had a restaurant called Jim's Grill. He also said that at the first meeting, here's who was there, so-and-so was there, so-and-so was there. And let me tell you, there was some black folks there too. picture that was leaning over Martin Luther King, Merle McClellan, he was there at the first meeting. We didn't know at the time his job was to do two things. One was to point everybody in the wrong direction. It was him that pointed and said the shots came from there. Not only was he an undercover cop, he was so undercover that his paycheck didn't even come from the Memphis Police Department, it came from the utility company. And now tonight, as we sit here, he's a CIA agent. His other job was to infiltrate a little group of little juvenile thugs. They call themselves the invaders. And y'all got to be careful about what y'all join just because they're yelling and screaming about white. Y'all got to be careful about what kind of evil, nasty black folk you get around that want to go blow up something and then wonder why you get arrested on your way there. Martin Luther King was preparing for the Poor People's March in Washington, D.C. Yeah, many senators and many Congress people said, we don't think he should come here because we are afraid of the amount of violence that will be created. Martin Luther King's answer to that was, I've led demonstrations, there's been violence, but it wasn't on our side. It was people attacking us. Now, if I'm going to be blamed for that, then there's something wrong. And so they decided that they would create a violent situation. And Merle McClellan, the undercover Memphis cop, had also infiltrated the invaders. And it was when King came in for one day to lead that march. One day. To lead that march. One day. And it was their job to see to it that it broke into a ride so King could no longer say that I've never led a march that led to a ride. And that was to force him to come back for a second march so they could kill him. And so all at once the King family decides to sue Lord Charles on a wrongful death suit. Not that they wanted any money, so the first time the truth could be validated and documented. There's a lot of people upset about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa, but a hundred years from now, because of that, a hundred years from now, nobody has to say, let me tell you what those black folks say they did to them. They can't say that now because white folks came and testified on the oath that this is what we did. Because of this trial, 
No longer will anybody be able to say, these conspirators alleged this to have happened. It's documented under oath. They subpoenaed the, the captain who was over the fire station, which was across the street, firehouse number two from the Lorraine Hotel. 34 years later, he's 34 years older, 7 years old, fat, get ready to die, wanting to find Jesus. So he came and raised his hand and told the truth. Would you give your name? Yes. How old are you? What's your occupation? I'm retired. What was it before you retired? The Memphis Fund. What was your top rank? Battalion commander. Where were you on April the 4th, 1968, when Martin Luther King was shot? He said, I was uh, in charge of the fire station across the street from the Lorraine Hotel. Did you notice anything different that day? Yeah, early that morning, some people came and introduced themselves as Army Intelligence. Said they'd like to go up on the roof and put King under surveillance. What'd you do? I led him up to the roof. What did they have with them? They had large containers, small containers. What do you think was in the containers? I don't know. What do you think? Well, it could have been stuff to take motion pictures, steel pictures. It could the containers held high pipe right? Yes, they could have. And then what happened? Well, later that day when the shot rang out, they were still on the roof. So we know that the United States government not only had pictures of Martin Luther King being killed, they also had pictures of the person that did it. He said, well, then what happened? He said, then I rushed across the street and ran up the steps where King was laying on the ground. And I helped put him on the stretcher. He said, did you get to see the wound? He said, yes. Would you describe it to the jury? He said, the wound was going up which means he had to have been shot from down here, not up there. He's a white man who ran the fire station, who probably 30-some years ago couldn't care if King lived or died. He's a white man sitting there saying to six blacks and six white jewelry that, yes, I saw the wound, and the wound went this way. And the next one that testified, testified that he had interviewed people from military intelligence, the 111, the 209. The 209 is so vicious, they'll scare the CIA. And the 184, that's the sniper team, that's the Rangers. When they had to admit they was there, they say, well, we was there as a backup, and that leads you to believe they was talking about to back up in case the security broke down. They was there to back up in case that hit didn't get, they were supposed to take him out. That's what the jewelry heard. Lord John's defense was real hip. There was so much overwhelming evidence that there was a conspiracy. His defense was, yes, I was part of a conspiracy. I just didn't know the person that I was supposed to have killed was Martin Luther King. And what made that so beautiful, it meant that they couldn't object to none of the stuff that was going because they wanted everybody to know what we knew, that it was a conspiracy. He just didn't know it was Dr. King. Seventy witnesses, they got to hear, for us to see that film. I got to listen to Earl Clark's wife. Who was Earl Clark? Well, when the shot rang out, the dude who shot took the rifle and gave it to Lord Jowers, and he took it through the back of his restaurant window, and then he jumped over a concrete embankment, and there was a black cab driver, Paul Butler, cab 58. He heard the shot, he didn't know King had been hit. He got out the cab to see what happened, see this white man jumping over this concrete embankment. So he followed him around the corner and watched him get into a police cruiser. That man who shot King 
was Earl Clark, Memphis cop. They had none. But they subpoenaed his wife. He came to defend the good name of Earl. My husband couldn't have done that because he was homesick all that day. Um, and what time did he find out Dr. King had been shot? Well, he found out over his police radio. And then what happened? He realized how serious it was that he had to go in. And then what happened? Well, all of his uniforms was in the cleaners. So I had to go get his uniform out. Ms. Clark, are you aware what time Dr. King was shot? Oh, I, I think it was a little bit after 6 o'clock. Ms. Clark, are you aware that the cleaners closed at 5? That's what the jewelry heard. Huh? That's what the jewelry heard. This FBI agent by the name of Donald Wilson. He's the one that found the Mustang that Lee Harvey Oswell was driving. He found it in Atlanta. And he found some notes in it that he said the minute he read the notes, he knew it was a conspiracy. But he called one of the numbers. This is 1968. That was on the number. And it ended up going to a nightclub in Dallas that Jack Ruby used to own, and Jack Ruby is the one who killed Lee Harvey Oswell, who was arrested for killing Kennedy. He said he got so scared he never turned it in because he thought if he turned it in and they know he looked at that, they would kill him. This is the FBI. And this is who we have to deal with every day. Those of us out here in the movement, have to deal with folks who are a white FBI agent said, I didn't turn this stuff in, because had I turned it in, it probably would have killed me. Hmm? That's some of the things they heard at the trial. Just to set the record straight, Jeremy Del Rey never confessed to killing King. He pleaded guilty. There's a difference if a cop grabbed me and said, I'll kill all your granddaughters if you don't say you took that person to plead guilty. A confession means you have to know some of the intricate details that nobody else knows but the police who was there investigating it and the person that did it. He never confessed. <clears throat> this document went into the records. He had probably one of the best defense attorneys that had ever lived in the history of the planet at the time. His defense attorney was called Percy Thorman from Houston. Lawyers used to come in from all over the world and just go to this bar where he used to hang out and just sit and listen to Percy talk. He was James L. Ray's lawyer. James L. Ray was coming up to be sentenced on March the 10th. Here's the letter that Percy Foreman, James L. Ray's lawyer, sent him on March the 9th, 1969. Percy Foreman, Houston, Texas, March the 9th, 1969. Mr. James Earl Ray, Shelby County Jail, Memphis, Tennessee. Dear James Earl, you've asked that I advance to your brother Ray, Jerry Ray, $500 of the $5,000 referred to in the first $5,000 paid by William Bradford Huey on January the 29th. Mr. Huey advanced an additional $5,000 at that time. I had spent in excess of $9,500 on your case. Since then, I have spent in excess of $4,000 additional. But I am willing to advance Jerry $500 and add that to the $165,000 mentioned in my other letter to you today. In other words, I would receive the first $165,500 but I would make 
the advance to your brother of $500. And this advance also is in contingent upon your plea of guilty at the sentencing tomorrow on March the 10th without any unseemly conduct on your part in the courtroom. Here's a man's lawyer that told him your father 30 years ago jumped bail. We're fixing to put him in jail. If you don't plead guilty, I, your lawyer, personally will see to it. You get the electric chair. And, and all the way, we're trying to explain how y'all got all this money so the government is going to say that your brother and you rob banks. So he's going to jail if you don't go in and plead guilty to him. The jury got this letter from his lawyer promising him $165,000, but it was contingent on him Thank you. Thank God to the King family. Thank God to William Pepper that handled that case. Thank God to everybody out here and the many people that died. His brother was murdered. They said he drowned in the swimming pool. Dr. King's brother, because he was questioning King's death. A.D. They tried to kill Coretta in the church and missed her and killed Dr. King's mother and made like it was some little crazy lunatic guy that came down. And yet the King family kept on moving. Never born with millions of dollars. Never had the glamour that the Kennedy family had, and yet the Kennedy family have spent one nickel trying to find out what had happened to the Kennedys, including that funny little thing that went down with John John last summer. Thank you. And so I say to you tonight, Make no doubt about it, we are in one of the most evil, nasty, vicious, insane, ungodly, unethical systems that's ever existed in the history of the planet. Amen. And not only will they kill black folks, they'll kill white folks that look like they're going to show us in a certain light. How many of y'all in here saw the movie The Green Mile? Thank you. How many of y'all didn't like it? I'll go back and see it again. I've seen it 13 times. And when you go back and really see what that movie's about, then you realize why Stephen King was hit with that truck. And then you realize why two months ago Stephen King had a press conference that he'll never write again. And then you realize last Friday this guy that got all kinds of bad records of driving went into court, one of the most powerful writers that ever lived, and got set free. And I'm going to say to you again, those of y'all that didn't like the movie, you should say a prayer that your mind will be open to see what you really saw. And those of you that haven't seen it every day that goes by without you seeing it, you do the 70 trillion sales in your body at this service. What's the name of the movie? The Green Mile. Who saw it? You remember what the black man's name was? John Coffey. John Coffey. And those initials is J. What? Go back and see the movie. And then read the New Testament because that movie is the story of Jesus Christ. They just took a mentally retarded nigga and made him Jesus. And most of y'all didn't even see that because y'all would expect a Ron Brown type nigga to be made Jesus. Huh? Huh? That white woman laying in the bed, that was Mary Magdalene. Y'all go back and see it. Those of you who didn't understand. Jesus Christ wasn't healing. He was pulling demons out of people and he cast them in the pigs and the pigs went crazy. In that movie, he pulled them demons out and cast it into that pig cop and he went crazy. Y'all go back and see that movie again. Oh, yes. In the Bible, when Jesus was in 
put on the cross, he was hung between two thieves. That was the two guys that got executed ahead of him. Yeah. And the one thief said, when you go to heaven, will you remember me? That was the Indian brother that said to Tom Hanks, if I repent now, will I be good? Y'all need to go back and y'all need to start breaking cold. But y'all can go, y'all like Matrix. Matrix, everything I did, like Matrix. Because they showed a black woman and a black man that had the finest mind in the history of the planet, but the white boy was the savior. Huh? I ain't met a black person that didn't like it. How can you like that film? And here a white man sit and took a memory retarded nigger and made him Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. And when he said, I leave here and I join my father in heaven. Okay, draw for this next part when uh, Jesse Jackson is trying to uh, shake hands with King. They're slowing it up right here. Pay attention to this. King refuses to shake his hand. He taps him on the shoulder and tr sticks his hand out, and King ignores him and sits down. Now, the indication that I get from that exchange is that King didn't want to have anything to do with Jesse. Probably didn't even want him on stage with him because King realized that Jesse Jackson was a sellout and a traitor. 